Now, Catherine Austin Fitz uh, joins us, and I'm glad that we uh, got her on today for the balance of the hour to talk about the move towards World War III, the open move for ground troops into Libya, talk of invasions into Syria, aircraft carriers steaming into the area, all of this coming down as they openly announce a private global corporate government we will pay our carbon taxes to. And she's a former Secretary of, uh, Assistant Secretary of Housing, for Federal House Commissioner under Bush 1, Managing Director and member of Wall Street firm Dylan Reed & Co. Uh, and she has uh, led the portfolios and investment strategy for $300 billion of financial assets and liability, Solari.com, and she blew the whistle on corruption more than a decade ago. And uh, she was also the president of Hamilton Securities Group, investment bank and financial software developer. She can expose the whole sh sh promise situation with that software. But Catherine, Am I wrong in saying we can see the acceleration? Clearly, they're pulling the trigger on on global conflict as a smokescreen for destabilization to further consolidate wealth worldwide. Well, the the, the great you know this has been going on for some time. We're moving into the Middle East and asserting much greater control. And part of that, Alex, is more war. And and part of it is with the economy. To the extent it is, you know, I hate to say this, but, but we're in a war machine, and the war machine needs another war. So whether it's conquest of more markets to keep the system subsidized or more war to keep the war machinery Hey, going. Catherine, are you on a cell phone? Yes. Because I'm, I'm having trouble picking up exactly. Are, are you near a landline? I'm not. Okay, well, just, uh, are you on a hands-free? Yes. Can you unplug yeah, well, the hands-free? I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm not using a headset. Okay, well, uh, j just try to get the receiver closer to your mouth because I want to be able to hear the important things okay. you're saying. Uh, go okay. ahead, start over. So, 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 Alex, the whole you know the whole planet is run with an investment model. I call it the central banking warfare model, and the, the central banks print money, and then the military makes people make it. And right now, it's in a downward spiral. It's not efficient. So as we centralize, we choke off real market activity. You're right, real markets work, and we're not using them. And the more centralized it becomes, the uh, you know, sort of the weaker it becomes, the more fragile it becomes, and then the more market you need. And so moving in in a much bigger way, it doesn't surprise me to Bilderbergers are talking about much more war in the Middle East. They need much more war in the Middle East, especially if you're going to keep driving up the oil price. So if you're not... If you're going to have a controlled and very high oil price, then you've got to assert control of the Middle East or you can't get there. So, you know, we've seen an effort globally to maintain a very high oil price, and, and they need much more control in the Middle East if they're going to make that happen, and they need it if they're going to keep the war economy going. So um, as long as we're in this model, we're going to see more and more warfare, both economic warfare and physical warfare, it's, a, it's sort of an economic imperative. Now, it's, it's very unpleasant, but the reality is, can we change the model? And you're right, part of changing the model is decentralizing. And right now, there's, you know, there's been a tremendous effort to centralize. And it's choking off entrepreneurial activity and capital to entrepreneurial activity everywhere. And, you know, one of the challenges, though, Alex, is if you look at every American's uh, household budget, and if you look at their assets and their savings and their investments, we're all financing it. So, you know, most people, for example, hold tremendous amounts of money in treasury securities and and other. And you talk about that, ways to to divest to get out of their system uh, on your Solari website. That's excellent. But why why every time a global implosion starts and they're greedily consolidating wealth, but it's also endangering their system at the same time? Why do these elites always try to launch new wars? Because war is good for business. In other words, war war. How did we get out of the depression? We have World War Two. So, unfortunately, we now have several generations of, of people, both leaders and, and societies, that know how to make money from war, but they don't know how to make money from peace. I mean, war is a good business, and it's, it's a way to generate business fast and, it's, and to pick up natural resources cheap and to get more. You know, I hate to say, you know, for, for many, many centuries, war is war, and that's what this system knows how to do. And the question is, can you know, can we can we get to another system? Part of what you're watching, and we're seeing this with the 
you know, the possibility of a Greek default yet again hanging over the market is is we have an entire generation of baby boomers in the first world who generated lots of capital, but now they're aging and, and they're ready to retire. And it's very economically attractive to abrogate those, those contracts and shift the capital out to the emerging markets or out into space, which is what they're doing. And and they've shifted that money out, and now the boomers are ready to retire, and that, that the politics of that have to be faced. And it's a very ugly politics, and it's a very scary politics. Yeah, the baby boomers' money... Have another war. Exactly. The baby boomers' money has been stolen, and so now we've got to go into a pure authoritarian system so they don't get too uppity uh, during that process. But I don't see things going well for the globalists, for the social engineers, and that's my big concern, Catherine, is that they're full of hubris, chutzpah, uh, whatever you want to call it, and they have the nukes, they have the military, but... Uh, and, and they're committed to holding on to power and expanding it, but you can see the collision course where it takes us uh, to to rack and ruin. I agree. I think they are having real trouble, and and they're having real trouble, Alex, because the you know implementing the various plans to let the baby boomers down, nice or hard, are not working. You know, trying to get the, an austerity program implemented in Greece. You know they're facing unbelievable pushback, and and so you have you have not only the sort of competition between the pro centralization and the pushback from everybody else, but but the other thing you've got is you've got real disagreements between the various leaderships. So the European leadership squabbling with the American leadership, and and the squabbles are very very hard to manage. And I think you know for for people to to be part of something, they need to have a, a, a real mission and vision that they share. It has to be about more than power. It has to be about more than money. It has to be part of something, you know, you all really want to be a part of and believe in. And, and they lack a vision which is really attractive and inspiring. You know, it, it, it lacks light. And so I think the chances of you know, of things falling apart because they can't hold it together are reasonably good. And, of course, that's always the risk uh, that, they, that that happens now. You know, I hate to tell you, if, if you really want to see a decentralized society, then we need the, the centralized society to fail. So, you know, you can't, you can't get to a success without having a failure of that which you don't want to And we've got to get in, in, in uh, prepared for the failure. It's not that we even want it to fail, or correct me if, if that's not your view. It's that their system is designed to consolidate and turn us into vassals while they kill us with the GMO food and, and the rest of it. And, and, and so their economic looting is a process of putting us into a servile position for our population to be reduced. It's like in James Bond movie. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. People need to really get through. <laughs> right, but remember, Alex, let me speak in your defense because I've been part of, you know, at a lower level, the leadership. And what I will say is they're grappling with a message from the American people that says, look, we just want more stuff. We want more money. We want more stuff. And we're not willing to be held accountable and live within a financially accountable model. So they've never seen a political, real political support in this country for anything that's, that's accountable, whether it's at the local or global level. But from the deep literature of the, of the upper crust to the ruling class, they are obsessed with a planetary dictatorship to forcibly reduce population. They do just call us right. a disease, and it's social Darwinism, so whatever horrible things they do to us is loving for the planet at the end of the day. Because after all, you know, it's kind of like you dehumanize the Native Americans before you kill them. Or you dehumanize right. the Arabs or, uh, before you kill them. Or you dehumanize right. the Jews before you kill them in Nazi Germany. We see the same mindset being... Uh, basically pushed. Right, we, see, we, see, we see an anti-humanist mindset, but we don't just see it at the top, Alex. It's, it, you know, at this point, it runs throughout throughout different parts of the culture. No, that so happens saying, in any big rodent population. If, if they've got, done studies, the rodents at a higher population start eating each other, killing each other. The rats start having wars. And you look at the general public, most of them hate each other. They're nasty. They're entitled. They're petulant. They're not excited. They're not seeing the beauty of the world. I agree with you. It's, it's very, very scary. So it's not just the social engineers making culture ugly. 
the general public. Uh, uh, you, you, some of them say, good, let us have war. Let us have destruction because they're so unhappy. That's because they are decadent and haven't tasted real, real degradation. They will beg and plead right. later. Right. So the, here's the reality. If, if you know, there are a lot of honest people in leadership positions, and what they've been taught is trying to do the right thing for the whole will only get you punished. And it's not just punished from the top, it's punished from the bottom. So that's part of the conundrum of how we get here to there. Now, what can people do? And I think the first thing is to think of law of attraction. What you want to do is you want to separate yourself out as much as possible. You want to put as many degrees of separation between you and the people who are centralizing things and also you and the people who are not productive. I mean, you, you want to limit your network, you want to limit your, your work and business life to people who are positive and who get real things done. And, and a lot of this is going to come because millions and millions of people, you know, I once had a friend who ran for governor in the state of Tennessee and he said, you know, you think of snowflakes as powerless until you realize if enough get together, they can shut down New York City. And the reality is the system we're watching can't succeed. And so the rest of us have got to withdraw and start, you know, and this is, comes down to thousands of incremental things to build a more self-sufficient, decentralized economy um, locally and in your networks. Everybody's different. So how it plays, you know, plays very much on where you are and, and what you're into. But you want to put as many degrees of separation between you and people who can be trusted as possible. It's just good old-fashioned common sense. And part of what we're seeing in the economy is people just withdrawing because they've had it. They realize something, you know, this is terribly unhealthy and terribly perverted. So they, you know, that's the natural recession that happens when people say, you know, I don't want to invest in this. This is too big. Well, it's it's all coming to a head, and uh, with all our military intel sources say they are getting ready for the big ground invasion of Libya and Syria and the whole nine yards, uh, which is what the Bilderberg Group reports uh, coming out last week confirmed. We've got a new uh, full data dump from the Bilderberg sources. Insider leaks uh, reveal full Bilderberg agenda on war and alternative media. And they are going to try to bring in a total authoritarian planetary system. And all of humanity needs to understand uh, that uh, these top globalists uh, are not going to give us any quarter. Okay, so let me make a prediction because the Bilderberger meeting is important. But for people based in North America, the most important meeting is coming up in the third week of July. And that's Bohemian Grove. And I know you know it's coming up, Alex. So that you've done more than anybody to bring transparency. Um, people will come to, you know, leaders will come together at the Grove. A lot of decisions will be made, including my guess is on the debt ceiling and sort of the budget deals for next year, but also currently. Um, and so and you're saying we'll see a lot of decisions at the end of July when they break up. By the way, the Washington Post had a big article today about it. I saw that. Yeah, I mentioned you. Well, it, well, it, it, it showed the um, our whole video uh, on YouTube, The Dark Secrets Inside Bohemian Grove, and it was a pretty fair piece. I mean, what does that say about the system that more and more uh, they are? Well, these, guys, these guys want to QE3, and the way they're going to get it is to let things really uh, slow down throughout the summer. Catherine, finishing up, you're right. Um, the, the, the ruling class that goes to Bilderberg, most of them also go to Bohemian Grove. And in that 15-day meeting... Uh, with all the male prostitutes and the and the drugs and the alcohol, uh, a lot of the decisions do get made. So you're predicting that we'll we'll see what's going to happen with the debt ceiling and so much more after the mainly uh, Republican leadership gets together uh, for a little uh, gay sex. Is that what you're saying, yeah, Catherine? Like, my my read is that they want another QE three. They they want they want to pump the economy hard. And they're going to do that, but they want political support for it. So they're going to let us really choke during the summer. The Grove will approve a QE3, and then we'll come out, and it'll be quite a fractious fall, but one in which inflation will kick up even more. So uh, I think they're working towards getting a QE3 and a deal on the, on the budget to really stick with the Main Street. And I think they'll get it. So um, it, it's going to make... Watch what they do at the Grove and watch what Congress does before it leaves, but right after the Grove gives them the signal. 
Absolutely. Well, uh, again, the website uh, for folks to uh, visit is solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com. Catherine, thank you for popping in with us to give us the latest on what's happening uh, economically. Have a great day, Alex. You too. There goes Catherine Austin Fitz, ladies and gentlemen.